Father, we thank you for this time here tonight. Once again, just come and study your word. Father, we just pray that you be with your servant tonight. Just give me what needs to be said. And Father, we just ask your blessings on the service. Just pray that you bless each and every one here. Bless those that are not able to be here. And Father, we just ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Tonight, we're continuing the series on false doctrines of Seventh-day Adventism. This is part three. Now, before we get started, I'm going to just go over a couple things for 10 minutes or whatever it is from last week that we were kind of touching on the end. And uh, I just want to make a clarification. So, like, if anybody's listening or, you know, whether somebody here or whatever. But remember, I was talking about the investigative judgment. And, you know, we were talking about, you know, that's where they believe that in 1844 that Jesus began clean, uh, cleaning out the Holy of Holies up in heaven. And I said that it happened at his, uh, you know, after his resurrection. We're going to pick it up from there. You know, I just want to go over, like I said, we're talking about Mary Magdalene and so much stuff. And I just want to make sure that everything's clear. But Jesus placed his blood on the heavenly mercy seat after his resurrection from the grave on that Sunday, not in 1844, and completed it that day. He is not still working on cleansing the heavenly mercy seat. He told Mary Magdalene to not touch him when he appeared to her after his resurrection that Sunday morning. If you guys want to turn to John 20, verse 17, we kind of went over it. Like I said, I want to try to <clears throat> just clarify everything. And I've added a few things just to, so if anybody's listening or somebody here, they might not still be on, that, on the same page. So John chapter 20, verse 17. John chapter 20, verse 17. Jesus saith unto her, Touch me not, for I am not yet ascended to my Father. But go to my brethren, and say unto them, I ascend unto my Father, and your Father, and to my God, and your God. Now if you look before that there, then you'll see... Uh, let's see. Oh, check. You know, right, right before that, you know, we saw in Luke last week how, you know, every, all the other women that were there, they had all left, and then Mary Magdalene stayed behind. But look at the key part there where it says, I am, you know, touch me not, for I am not yet ascended to my Father. Keep that in mind while I'm going to be reading here. You know, this, this was because Jesus had not ascended to heaven to place his blood on the heavenly mercy seat which was necessary to complete his redemption for all people. You know, that's why I said, you know, Mary Magdalene could not touch him. Now we know the phrase, I am not yet ascended to my Father, refers to Jesus as our high priest going to place his blood on the heavenly mercy seat and not his ascension 40 days after his resurrection. We all know 40 days after his resurrection, that's when he ascended and stayed up, you know, up in heaven. So, you know, you'd be like, okay, so, but he's telling you right here, I'm ascending to my Father. That's what this is talking about here. It's not talking about 40 days from now. He's talking about that very day he had ascended to heaven to place his blood on the heavenly mercy seat. That's what completed our redemption. Jesus reappeared to his disciples that very resurrection Sunday after he completed his mission of placing the blood on, on the heavenly mercy seat. Whereas after his ascension 40 days later, he never did reappear here on earth. If Jesus had never placed his blood on the mercy seat, we would still be dead in our sins. This completed what was started on the cross. If Mary had touched him before he had placed his blood on the heavenly mercy seat, the blood of Jesus would have been polluted. Turn to Hebrews chapter 9, verse 12. Hebrews chapter 9, verse 12. You know, there's a lot of places in Hebrews that, that show some of this stuff, but I'm just going to hit on just a couple verses in Hebrews. But Hebrews chapter 9, verse 12. Okay. 
Okay, Hebrews chapter 9, verse 12. Neither by the blood of goats and calves, but by his own blood, he entered in once into the holy place, having obtained eternal redemption for us. So Hebrews right here is showing us that Jesus took his own blood and entered once into the holy place. That's what happened on this resurrection Sunday. That's when he went and he ascended. Said, you know, he said, I have to ascend to my father. That's what he was doing at that time. He ascended, and then once he placed that blood on the mercy seat, that completed the redemption. You know, everybody says it was complete on the cross. It was not complete on the cross. If he had never placed his blood on the heavenly mercy seat, we would still be dead in our sins. That's what completed the redemption. And, you know, it clearly shows you here that he went there. Now, again, it wasn't an all-day, you know, it doesn't say how long it took him or whatever. But we know that later on that day, that he met those men on the road to uh, Mass and Masses. I never can get that word right. Emmaus or whatever it is. Yeah. Emmaus. And um, then later on, he met the disciples, you know, in that upper room. So, you know, it wasn't, you know, this wasn't days later or something like that. That very day, he had completed it. But it shows, you know, that's why he can be touched. And at that point, then, like you said, he, he told me that you could touch him, do whatever. That, you know, once that blood was placed on the, on the heavenly mercy seat, he could be touched. But the very fact that Jesus could not have been touched prior to this was seen even in the earthly Israelite priests who are not allowed to be touched by anyone before they placed the blood of the animal on the earthly mercy seat. Remember, before they went and placed, you know, the, the, the high priest, before he placed this blood in there, they had to wash themselves and get all cleaned up and everything because they were going into a holy place. And everybody had to stay away from them. And nobody was allowed to be around them. Couldn't go and touch them. Because again, they were setting the example of, uh, you know, every. remember I told you, everything here on earth is just a pattern of the real thing in heaven. So they were setting the example of what Jesus was going to do later on for the real thing. And that's why, you know, they couldn't be touched or anything. But like I said, remember the Israelite priest was just a pattern of the real thing in heaven. And what the Israelite priest did with placing the blood on the mercy seat was just a reminder of the real blood that would be placed on the heavenly mercy seat in heaven. Now the Israelite high priest was a type of Jesus who is the real high priest. Turn to Hebrews chapter 3 verse 1. Hebrews chapter 3 verse 1. You know again, everybody was just an example. You know, Jesus is our high priest. And the earthly high priest was just a type of Jesus as the real high priest who had placed that blood on the heavenly mercy seat. But Hebrews chapter 3 verse 1. Wherefore, holy brethren, partakers of the heavenly calling, consider the apostle and high priest of our profession, Christ Jesus. So it clearly shows you that Jesus is our high priest. And then turn back to uh, the Old Testament. Go to Exodus chapter 25, verse 9. Exodus chapter 25, verse 9. Should have had you hold there Hebrews, but that's okay. Exodus chapter 25, verse 9. These, these are some examples here of showing you how that everything on here on earth is just a pattern of the real thing in heaven. You know, and we know there were a lot of different things in the Old Testament that showed things that were types of Jesus and so forth. But Exodus chapter 25, verse 9. According to all that I show thee, after the pattern of the tabernacle and the pattern of all the instruments thereof, even so shall ye make it. You know, this was God talking to Moses here and telling him that everything that he's telling him to do, that these were patterns of the real thing that he had. That's why he had them follow everything exactly. And he felt that everything had to be done exactly the way God told Moses it had to be done. Because they were representative of the real thing in heaven. They were patterns of them. Then to go back to Hebrews, like I said, I should have had you stay there. But Hebrews chapter 9, verse 23 and 24. Hebrews chapter 9, verse 23 and 24. You know, remember a lot of Hebrews, especially chapters 8 and 9 and so forth, it's all about showing how the priesthood, the Israelite priesthood was just a type of the real priesthood of Jesus, and it was showing you that it was not efficient for our sins, that, you know, you had to have Jesus. So, you kind of read those chapters and stuff, but Hebrews chapter 9, verses 23 and 24. 
It was therefore necessary that the patterns of things in the heavens should be purified with these, but the heavenly things themselves with better sacrifices than these. For Christ is not entered into the holy places made with hands, which are the figures of the true, but into heaven itself, now appear in the presence of God for us. In other words, it's telling you again, reminding you what we just read about in Hebrews 9, 12, where he went into the holy place, entered into the holy place that was made not by hands of man, but rather hand, you know, the hand of God. And it is the figure of the true. In other words, it's the real thing versus what I read to you in Exodus. Those are patterns. This is it's telling you this is the one in heaven is the real thing. And, you know, it says there in verse 23 that the heavenly things themselves are better sacrifices. In other words, they sacrificed the earthly high priest. They had the sacrifice of the animals. Jesus used his actual real blood as the God man. And that is the, the, the only sacrifice. That, that's the true sacrifice that was necessary. That place of that blood on it. And I previously mentioned in other sermons how Jesus also placed his blood on the earthly mercy seat as well when his blood ran through a crack in the rocks caused by the earthquake at his death and dripped his blood on the earthly mercy seat hidden underground below where he was crucified. Remember I told you about that. And, and you know, I read in scripture where it talks about when he died on the cross, there was that earthquake that, that rent the rocks, it said, you know, which means split the rocks. And underneath that, then below those rocks, then Ron Wyatt had, had uh, found the Ark of the Covenant and found that his blood had dripped right on the earthly mercy sheet. So, you know, Jesus completed everything. Not only did he place it on the heavenly one, but he also had to fulfill. You know, again, the earthly ones were a type of him, so he was also fulfilling the duty of the priest here on earth. That he put it on the earthly mercy seat and put it on a real one there in heaven, because that's the one that really counts. That's but he was still showing you that you know he, he always Jesus always obeyed the law to the left. So that's why he put it on the earthly mercy seat as well, even though it necessarily wasn't required in that sense, but he always fulfills the law. And so as the high priest, he did just like the earthly high priest. So Jesus completely pleaded, placing his blood on the heavenly mercy seat on Resurrection Sunday. Then the cleansing process was complete, not 1844 as they claim, as the Seventh-day Adventists claim. Jesus then reappeared that same day on that Resurrection Sunday to his disciples, and they could be touched without being included as redemption was not complete. You know, and that's why he even said later on, he's like, you can touch me, do whatever you want. But, you know, he told Mary, you can't touch me. But then later on, he's like, you can touch me. You know, it wasn't that he had something against Mary, but he hadn't completed his mission. And if Mary had touched him, then he would have been polluted. It would now, have stopped everything. Exactly. It would defeat the whole thing. And, you know, he would have died from naught and everything else. But some liberal theologians, such as John MacArthur, I don't think too highly of him, and I don't care if he, I'll say it to his face. Say the blood of Jesus only represented his death. You know, that is damnable heresy, as I have shown, just as the belief of the Seventh-day Adventists. The blood of Jesus is what saves us and gave us our salvation. It is not just representative of his death. Number one, his death doesn't mean anything without his shed blood. Muhammad and all these other, Buddha and all these other people, they die. It's the fact that he shed his holy God-man blood for us and then rose again on that, that third day and then he placed this blood on the heavenly mercy seat to complete the whole mission. That's what completed our, our salvation. You know, it's not just representative of his death. You know, like I said, when you go around teaching that stuff, like he teaches, he teaches you know, all this Calvinism and all this other stuff. Like I said, he's a... He teaches a lot of dangerous things that Christians should just avoid that individual. But I have shown how without the precious blood of Jesus, we would still be dead in our sins. You know, as I said, the blood of Jesus represents much more than the death of Jesus. It re represents our redemption and salvation as it was placed on the heavenly mercy seat. Now notice that Jesus telling Mary he must ascend to heaven to complete the redemption for our sins. Is found in verse 17 of John 20. You know, I read that to you in the beginning. And like I said, I've told you that before. People argue with me, but they're wrong. The verse numbers and chapter numbers are just as much inspired as the words themselves. 
The very fact that it's found in verse 17 is not a coincidence. The number 17 means victory, which we now have over death and sin, with Jesus completing redemption for us. The very fact that Jesus is seated at the right hand of God the Father, as mentioned in Hebrews 12, 2, and many other verses in Hebrews and other places in Scripture, it shows that Jesus finished cleansing the heavenly mercy seat at the time he placed his blood on it. There's at least eight times I can think of off my head where it tells you in Scripture that he's seated at the right hand of God the Father. A person sits down when the work is complete. The real completion of cleansing of the heavenly mercy seat will take place when God creates the new heaven. So even though it is complete, it will really be cleansed in the sense that they won't try to say it's cleansed in that sense. When we get a new heaven and new earth, because right now, you know, he has to cleanse the heaven, the third heaven, the, the heavenly of heavens of heavens, just like every, you know, the earth and everything else, because Satan has been in there. His, he has polluted heaven. So that's why the actual real heaven where God's at, you know, gets going to get cleansed too. You know, there's going to be new heavens and new earth. But anyway, I just wanted to kind of point that out. You know, and like I said, I know I spent a little bit of time, but I want to clarify, not only to somebody might be listening, but just to everybody here, that... How important it was that, you know, it wasn't like you said, like these new Bibles where they'll go and say that, you know, they'll change marriage and like, don't touch me, just don't cling to me. There's a big difference. I can go up to you and give you a hug and that's clinging to you, or I just go and I touched you. You know, that's a difference. And that's what Jesus was saying. You can't even, not even, it's not just you can't even give me a hug. You just can't even touch me. Just don't even, just stay away. You know, you touch me and I will be polluted. And that's what Jesus was saying. And he had a sin. He ascended shortly after that. And then, like I said, whatever, how long, you know, hours later, whatever, then he reappeared. So, you know, I just wanted, I wanted to clarify that. But uh, let's, let's move on now and uh, look at the next false doctrine of Seventh-day Adventism. And that is that baptism, they believe that baptism is necessary for salvation. Now, Adventists say that a person must be baptized before they are saved without baptism they will not enter into the kingdom of heaven. Now their website does not say this along with many other their false doctors to have the appearance of being true Christians, but their writings say otherwise. You know, that, see, that's what a lot of these cults do is, I told you in the beginning, the very first week we were doing this, how, especially in the last 30 years or so, they've been really trying real hard to make themselves look like real Christians. You know, true Christians. So they've been trying to change things on their, like their website and stuff like that. They won't put, you know, just like the Mormons, like I told you, they won't put the deep, nasty doctrines on there. They'll, they'll only put things on there that make them sound like Christians. But then you get into their writings and you get into their other stuff and you find out the truth. And, you know, just like with Mormonism and so forth. And, you know, they're, they're no different here. But this is what they really, truly believe is that baptism is necessary for salvation. You know, as all cults, they'll lie to you. So, like, you, know, you can go down here to the local church and, you know, you ask them and they'll probably sit there and lie to your face because, again, they're trying to get you to join them. They don't want, you know, they're not going get, to get you in there if they tell you the truth of some of these things they believe is like this investigative judgment and some of this other stuff. You know, we'll get into some other things that you're going to see that are kind of masking Jehovah's Witnesses. And, and uh, you know, if you knew this stuff, the average, a true Christian is not going to go, oh, I'm going to go join that church. But uh, let's see. The Seventh day Adventist book, called Believe, on page 182 says, quote, Christ made it clear that he required baptism of those who wish to become part of his church, his spiritual kingdom, end quote. And then this here is from, um, well, also on that same page, in another quote, it says, In baptism, believers enter into the passion experience of our Lord. So, I mean, it's clear they're telling you that baptism is required. Then on page 184 of this same book, Believe, it says, quote, Baptism also marks person's entrance into Christ's spiritual kingdom. It unites the new believer to Christ, end quote. Now, the Seventh-day Adventist website says, uh, Baptism, quote, Baptism is a symbol of our union with Christ, the forgiveness of our sins, and our reception of the Holy Spirit. 
Well, you guys have heard me tell you before, a baptism does not forgive sins and is not even symbolic of it or the, quote, reception of the Holy Spirit. You know, again, that's what, like, the Roman Catholics teach you, that when you get baptized, that's when you supposedly receive the Holy Ghost and, you know, this type of stuff, and, and then it forgives you of your sins and you become a member of the church as well. You know, like I said, all these cults, they, they have a lot of these similar beliefs, you know. But a person receives the Holy Ghost, whether they ever get baptized or not, the moment you truly receive Jesus as your Savior, I don't care if you never get baptized till the day you die, and you live 50 years as a Christian, you still have the Holy Ghost within you. You know, baptism has nothing to do but with it. And baptism will not forgive your sins, and it will not make you a Christian. It doesn't reunite us with Christ or anything else. You know, again, it, you know, so even on their website, there are some things that you dig deep enough. It's just you got to find, like I said, they're not in the most obvious places. you got to dig in there. But like I said, a person receives the Holy Ghost at the moment of true salvation, not when they're baptized. And I want that clear. They believe, a per the Seventh-day Adventists believe a person is born again when they are baptized. You know, we've talked about that before too, that you're born again the moment you're truly saved is a, is a you're asking Jesus as your Savior, not when you're baptized. You know, the thief on the cross, he was uh, born again, excuse me, when he believed on Jesus. And he was never baptized, but Jesus said that very day he would be with him in paradise. But the Seventh-day Adventists, like all cults, will change a biblical term and give it a new meaning. You know, we saw that, you know, the uh, Mormons, Roman Catholics, all of them, they always, you know, the Jehovah's Witnesses, they, always, they take this born-again stuff and they give it a whole new definition. That's why I say when you're talking to people, you have to be careful sometimes on how you say things and, you know, what, so what do you mean by, like, you know, being born again? What, what's it mean to you? Because what they think of being born again is not necessarily what Scripture says about being born again. But a person, is, as I said, is born again when they are saved, not when they are baptized. Scripture says a person must believe first and then be baptized after they are saved. And if a person is truly saved but never gets baptized, they can still go to heaven, as I mentioned, such as the thief on the cross. Let's turn to Acts chapter 8, verses 36 and 37. Acts chapter 8, verse 36 and 37. And this one here, I've mentioned it before, but a lot of your modern Bibles take Acts 8, 37 and just throw it in the garbage. So, you know, again, to support some of their false beliefs and so forth, and work salvation and infant baptism and all these other things, but... Acts chapter 8, verses 36 and 37. And as they went on their way, they came onto a certain water. And the eunuch said, See, here is water. What doth hinder me to be baptized? And Philip said, If thou believest with all thine heart, thou mayest. And he answered and said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. But clearly, if you see in this verse, it tells you you have to believe that Jesus is the Son of God first. Once you believe, then you get baptized. You know, he didn't say, well, let's go down and get baptized, and then, you know, that'll make you a Christian, or, or then you can believe whether Jesus is God or not. You know, that's not how it works. You believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God first, then you get baptized. But Jesus told the repentant thief that he would be with him in paradise that day. I mentioned that a while ago, but let's look up that first. Luke chapter 23, verse 42. Luke chapter 23, verse 42. You know, I remember I mentioned how the uh, Jehovah's Witnesses and some other Bibles, you know, they, well, they, went, they changed, they moved the comma to make it look like he was just saying that, you know, you wouldn't necessarily be with me today, but at some point in the future you would be with me, you know. But like I said, they're always deceptive on these little things. But Luke chapter 23, verse 42. And Jesus said unto him, Verily I say unto thee, Today shalt thou be with me in paradise. But notice that. He's saying that very day. Today shalt thou be with me in paradise. I said, the Jehovah's Witnesses take that comma and move it over to the other side of today. So it's, it's, they're making it sound like Jesus said to him that day that you shall be with me in paradise, but not necessarily that day. You know, So it's a little thing like just moving that comma 
People don't pay attention to this stuff. I do. And it makes a big difference on a lot of things. That's why I said these new Bibles are just completely dangerous and need to go right in the garbage. They are not the Word of God. And shame on all these churches that are using them. The next false doctrine we're going to look at is the uh, remnant church in Revelation. The Seventh-day Adventists teach that they are the remnant church remaining in Revelation chapter 14, just before the second coming of Jesus. You know, we know that right before the end, when Jesus returns, there will still be some people on live here. You know, we know that uh, one third of all the Jewish people get saved right before his return, and there'll be some other people to get saved during this time period. And anybody that you know hasn't died as a martyr or whatever, if they're still physically alive at the time, will go into the millennium with Jesus. And these the Seventh Day Adventists believe that they're that remnant of that church that's left over there. You know, they they believe that that's them. Well, let me tell you, if that's them, they're not saved because they would they missed the boat. So you know they missed the rapture. So that's not saying a whole lot. They're basically admitting they're not not true, true Christians. But uh, as I said, they believe they are the restored true church, as all others were corrupt. You know, again, we see that over and over with these cults that you know they're the new, they're the latest ones. You know, the Mormons or the, whoever they. Oh, uh, we got this new revelation and. All these other churches have been corrupt, but, you know, God came to me, and we got it all fixed out. Now we're the, the, the proper church. And, and, you know, so again, God was a liar, because then for all these years, he never had a true church around. And, you know, God said he would preserve the church. So, you know, they're, again, they're making themselves look foolish if they would just keep their mouth shut. But they say they proclaim the, quote, three angels' message of Revelation chapter 14 verses 6 through 12. This here is uh, from the Seventh Day Adventist 28 Fundamentalist Beliefs. This is a quote from it. The universal church is composed of all who truly believe in Christ, but in the last days, a time of widespread apostasy, a remnant has been called out to keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. This remnant announces the arrival of the judgment hour, proclaims salvation through Christ, and heralds the approach of the second advent. This proclamation is symbolized by the three angels of Revelation chapter 14. It coincides with the work of judgment in heaven and results in a work of repentance and reform on earth. Every believer is called to have a personal part in this worldwide witness." End quote. Now, in fact, the, the church's original symbol was three angels circling a globe. Today, it is three flames representative of the Holy Ghost and the three angels. But, you know, they get these beliefs from, um, you know, like, like I said, it's just, it's just another false doctrine that they come up with. And, uh, you know, trying to act like they're the ones that survived in the end and they're the ones being punished and... So forth. But like I said, if they're the true, true church that ends up there at the end, then they were not, then they're definitely not the true church now. Because like I said, your true believers won't be around at the end. They'll have already been raptured. And the um, there'll be people that get saved, but those were people that were not saved prior to this. So, you know, one way or the other, they're wrong. Either they're not saved now, or, you know, I mean, you can't, you can't have it. It, it. They're basically. Uh, but yeah, like I said, it's just I'm not going to get into that right now because it just it doesn't matter that some of their beliefs are just too bizarre. But the, the next false thing we're going to look at is the obedience of the Ten Commandments will determine if saved or not. Now Seventh Day Adventists teach in number. 18 of their 28 fundamentalist beliefs. They have these things they call the 28 fundamentalist beliefs. Number 18 of that, they teach that they will be judged based on our obedience of the Ten Commandments. Now, Scripture says we will be judged on whether we are washed in the blood of Jesus or not, and not on how well we obey the Ten Commandments. Now, don't get me wrong, we should obey them, but they do not determine our salvation. As long as you call upon the name of the Lord, 
you know, yeah, you're gonna, it's going to affect different rewards and different things like that, positions you get in heaven, you know, if you're not obeying the Ten Commandments. But if you, uh, you know, don't sit here and follow all the Ten Commandments, it's not going to determine whether you get saved or not. That was the whole point of why Jesus came in the first place. Is because that's what they were trying to do in the Old Testament, was all live off the, the, the Ten Commandments. And if the Ten Commandments could save you, there was no point for Jesus to even ever come in the first place. And the reality is, there isn't one of us that could ever keep all the Ten Commandments, and including the Seventh-day Adventists. You know, but they say they want to push that because, again, they want to try to push... Remember, I, I mentioned how they have the Saturday Sabbath. Well, that, that's one of the things. They're trying to push that we need to obey these, the Ten Commandments. But I've already shown you how that doesn't apply to us. But as I said, we should obey them. But again, it's not going to determine our salvation. Let's look at Galatians chapter 3, verses 10 through 13. Galatians chapter 3, verses 10 through 13. You know, like I said, I'm not encouraging people to go out there and purposely break them and so forth. You know, I think if you commit a sin and you break one, you need to repent of that and, you know, ask Jesus to forgive you. But it's not going to determine whether you get saved or not. But Galatians chapter 3, verses 10 through 13. For as many as are of the works of the law are under the curse, for it is written, Cursed is everyone that continueth not in all things which are written in the book of the law to do them. But that no man is justified by the law in the sight of God, it is evident for the just shall live by faith. And the law is not of faith. But the man that doeth them shall live in them. Christ hath redeemed us from the curse of the law, being made a curse for us. For it is written, Cursed is everyone that hangeth on a tree. So it clearly shows you in these verses that the law is not, you know, considered a curse. Jesus became that curse to replace, you know, so that. Because we can't live under the law. Like I told you, that was the whole point of why he had to come. You know, it was a curse to try to even be living that way. That's what it says here. That, you know, to continue living that way, it's just, it's just a curse. And it says that no man, in verse 11, no man is justified by the law in the sight of God. And it says we, are to, we shall live by faith. You know, <clears throat> it says right in verse 12, the law is not faith. You know, and, and we've, we've known before, we, you know, we've read Ephesians many times, 2, 8, 9, where it talks about, you know, that we're not saved by our works, you know, lest any man suppose and so forth. You know, we're saved by faith and so forth. But, and that's what it's saying here, that the law is not faith. You know, that if it was, then that, those verses would be a lie. That, you know, it shows many other places we're saved by faith. We're not saved by the law. It says right here, the man that doeth them shall live in them. You know, notice, you know, but, and then it tells us again how Jesus became a curse of the law. You know, he became a curse for us. You know, basically, redeem us. It says, Christ hath redeemed us from the curse of the law, being made a curse for us. So it's showing you, because he became that curse by us, but he got crucified on that tree, you know, the cross there, then he redeemed us from the curse of the law. You know, it's telling you, the law is a curse. So that, you know, if we're sitting here trying to still live under it, then you're making the work what Jesus did for us on the cross, again, all for naught, kind of like a lot of these other cults all do, you know, and that's that's what they're always trying to do. Cults are always trying to minimize what Jesus has done for us and trying to add extra things or take away things or doing whatever. And, and you know, like I said, it's just one way of them trying to justify their Saturday Sabbath, which again is unscriptural. Well, let's uh, move on to some other stuff here. This Ellen G. White, remember I told you, she was basically the founder of the Seventh-day Adventist. She was supposedly a prophet, and her writings were, were inspired according to what Seventh-day Adventists believe. Now, she was a false prophet, and her writings were far from being inspired. I'm going to show you some of it. I'm just going to mention some of the stuff here. But Seventh-day Adventists believe that Ellen G. White was a prophet of God, and her many writings are inspired. Now, Ellen herself said her writings were inspired. 
So I mean, that shows some arrogance right there on her own part. I mean, she just thinks that she's, you know, she don't stink, let's put it that way. Well, let me tell you, her writings are not inspired. But uh, that right there, you can find that, and they have a thing, Seventh-day Adventists have a, a thing called Testimonies. These are from Ellen G. White. And it's called Testimonies, Volume 5, on page 64, and Spiritual Gifts, Volume 2, page 293. You know, they've accumulated like a bunch of her writings and all this stuff, and all these different books and different things. And, you know, like I said, they have all these things they consider of inspired writings. And that's why I said, you're going to see some of the stuff I read here. You'll find out what some of the things they really believe. But her writings are considered equal with Scripture. Again, this is adding to God's word as all cults do. You know, all cults always have something like that. The Roman Catholics add books to the Bible, plus they have the, uh, the, the Catechism of the Catholic Church book, and they have all their stuff. And they have, uh, you know, the Mormons have the Book of Mormon, and, you know, the other two, and so forth. And uh, the Jehovah's Witnesses have their own Bible, and they have the, the, uh, um, Watch the Watchtower, thank you. The Watchtower magazine, and you know, I mean, all these cults always have something that they add. Well, the Seventh Day Adventists are no different. They add Ellen G. White's writings to, you know, and then they'll also have their own Bible, which we'll get into later on. But, you know, they all cults always are adding to God's Word. You know, they subtract from God's Word too, but they they, they do both. They're good at, at multiplication, and, I mean, uh, addition and subtraction, and, you know, they're they always trying to change, change things. But, you know, God condemned this in, uh, turn to Revelation chapter 22, verses 18 and 19. You're going to see where he tells us not to add or subtract, take away from his words. But like I said, this is something that every cult does. You know, some in more extreme forms than others and so forth, but they all do it. Revelation chapter 22, verses 18 and 19. And this is right before the end of Scripture. And God's given this final warning, once again, to let people know, don't do this. And that's what all these new Bibles are doing, too. They're adding to and taking away from God's Word. So I said, they need to go right in the garbage. They're not God's Word. For I testify, is Revelation chapter 22, verses 18 and 19. For I testify unto every man that heareth the words of the prophecy of this book. If any man shall add unto these things, God shall add unto him the plagues that are written in this book. And if any man shall take away from the words of the book of this prophecy, God shall take away his part out of the book of life and out of the holy city and from the things which are written in this book. You know, and that not only applies to the book of Revelation, but to all of Scripture in general. And there's also other, and people want to argue and say, oh, well, that only refers to Revelation. I could pull up verses from the Old Testament and so forth to tell you the same thing about not adding or subtracting to Scripture. So, you know, don't give me this nonsense. It's just, we're about to talk about the book of Revelation. It's not. It's talking about all of Scripture. And just don't do it, trust me. When the Seventh-day Adventists are baptized, they must believe in all Seventh-day Adventist teachings, including those from Ellen G. White. Now this is from the official baptism creed of the Seventh-day Adventists. It's 11 of 13 of their uh, baptism creeds. And this is what it says. It says, I know and understand the fundamental Bible principles as taught by the Seventh-day Adventist Church. It is my purpose, by the grace of God, to order my life in harmony with these principles. So in other words, they have to, they have to everything that's taught by the Seventh-day Adventists, well, that includes their writings. Because again, remember I told you, her writings, L.G. White's writings, are considered inspired. In fact, honestly, they, you know, just like the Roman Catholics, they say that tradition is equal. No, tradition overrides scripture. It's the same thing here. Ellen G. White's writings override scripture. So if you try to show them something in scripture, and Ellen G. White says something else, oh, well, she got the latest revelation and everything. I mean, they can, they, they, like I said, they'll tell you one thing to your face, that double tongue, but they're lying. They're, they're, their fruit bears them out. But Ellen G. White's writings and beliefs have many falsehoods in them which show she was not a true prophet and her writings were not inspired. Now God said if a prophet predicted something that was not true, 
they were not one of his prophets. And I know we've gone over before on other coke, but I think it's important. Plus, people may not listen to some of those other ones, but I want to show this again. Turn to Deuteronomy chapter 18, verse 22. You know, every cult, it's important we show some of these things over and over because they're all guilty of it. But Deuteronomy chapter 18, verse 22. In Deuteronomy chapter 18, verse 22. When a prophet speaketh in the name of the Lord, if the thing follow not, nor come to pass, that is the thing which the Lord hath not spoken. But the prophet hath spoken it presumptuously. Thou shalt not be afraid of him. And we're going to see where she's made predictions and different things and so forth and prophecies that are false. So she is a false prophet. Well, she's dead now, but burned in hell. But she's she's a, a false prophet. It was Does a false God prophet. Use women to, Do I know? Did God use women to prophesy? I mean, there's some that they talk about prophetesses, but I don't think it's in the same sense that like a man was. I think it was really only the men. And that's the other thing, too. I don't think God would use a woman. You know, when he's talking about the prophetess, like, you know, he says Miriam was a quote prophetess. She was saying certain things, but she wasn't a prophet in the same sense like Daniel and some of these other people were. You know, it's not, it's, it's, it's not, um, I don't know how to describe it, but it, no, basically God only used men for prophets, just like he used only men to write his holy word, and just only men are to be preachers. You know, there are places for women, but that's not one of them, and, you know, so again, I think that showed right there, too, where it's a false church. God's not going to found his true church on a woman, you know, and it's not trying to belittle women, I'm just telling you the facts. that you just taking me from Points. They had this, exactly. They had different places. It's just like in a marriage or whatever. Then you know the man is the head of the house. You know, and women have places for different things too. You know, so. Uh, but uh, you know, it's just like you said. There, women have their places, but being a prophet is not one of them. But I'm going to give you uh, just a few examples of her false beliefs. That supposedly came in visions from God. Remember I told you how she had supposedly, I think it was what I said, like 200 or 2,000 visions or something. I'd have to look it up again. But she had all these, supposedly all these visions. Now, like I said, I'm not denying she probably had visions, but they weren't from God. They were probably from Satan. But her own teachings changed over the years and contradict each other at times. Now, this would not happen if inspired from God and, and they were true. Now, I understand, it's like me. Over the years, the more you study stuff and things like that, I might change a little bit here and there on certain things as I learn more, but I don't claim to be inspired either. So, you know, but if I'm being inspired, if I, what I'm telling you, if I was inspired of God, my belief would never change 50 years from now. It would still be the same because that's what God gave me. God doesn't go around change and say, you know, you know, like homosexuality, that, well, it was an abomination, but now, today, in our day and age, it's perfectly normal, and they're just born that way, and they're fine. No, they're not. It's straight from Satan and straight from hell. The people wake up. It's still an abomination under the Lord. You can take your LGBT and send it straight to hell. Uh, but like I said, it would not happen if, you know, she would not be changing if her writings were inspired from God and they were true. Well, let's look at the first one here we want to look at is she said that the brothers of Jesus were older than him when scripture says he was the firstborn son of Mary. This is from her book called Desire of Ages, pages 86 through 87. Now, we all know this, but turn to Matthew chapter 1, verse 25. Matthew chapter 1, verse 25. You know, we all know that Jesus did have brothers, unlike what the Roman Catholic Church teaches. But they were younger than him. They were not older than Jesus. Jesus was the oldest child. Matthew chapter 1 verse 25. And knew her not till she had brought forth her firstborn son. And he called his name Jesus. You know, of course, that's referring to Joseph not having had relations with Mary prior to the birth of Jesus. You know, after the birth of Jesus, then he did 
And then Mary ended up having you know, four more sons and at least two daughters. But they were all younger than Jesus. You know, they were not older. So right there, she just said one thing that we can prove right from Scripture, that it's a lie. So right there, she's a false prophet. Now here's another one. Listen, I mean, listen to some of these things that she comes up with. But This one here is uh, from her early writings. Well, she says that angels need a gold card to get in and out of heaven. You know, I guess it's kind of like Willy Wonka, the chocolate fact, you got to have that, you know, golden ticket or whatever. Well, they have to have a gold card to get in and out of heaven. Now, I don't know, maybe it's kind of like when you go to the, 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 a lot of these uh, motels and stuff, and you got to have that little card, you know, that you got to go up there and it's annoying, the thing never wants to work. Well, I guess it's kind of the same thing with them. And I guess they can't have the silver card, you know, they make sure it's a gold card, you know, so. But, um, you know, so maybe that's the, maybe that's the uh, American Express card or something, I don't know. But anyway. Her uh, early writings on page 39 says, quote, All angels that are commissioned to visit earth hold a golden card, which they present to the angels at the gates of the city. Now again, scripture clearly never says such a thing. So, just say hypothetically it was true. Again, she's adding to scripture because God's word was complete. You know, with Genesis through Revelation, you know, she's claiming she got these new visions. Well, again, that's adding to scripture, like all these cults do, the Mormons and so forth. That, well, now I've got this new thing. You know, God just revealed me that they have to have a gold card or whatever, you know, and so forth. Plus, it's going to be spiritual and we're not going to be carrying something. Right. I mean, well, it, it, it's just some of this stuff is, I don't know how people fall for it, but I don't know, whatever. But the next thing she says, saved people in the resurrection will have wings. So if you can't fly, or you know, everybody says angels have wings, but you know, don't worry, you're going to get your wings someday, girl. So, uh, but this is also from her early writings, and that's on page 53. Now, we will have bodies like that of Jesus and not have wings. You know, again, our bodies will be just like we'll be now. We'll have a resurrected body, a glorified body, but it's still going to look like us. We don't have wings now. I'm not all of a sudden going to get my glorified body and I got wings sprouting out of me or something. Uh, you know, in fact, even most angels, you know, people always talk about, you know, when an angel gets his wings and, you know, whatever, I can't remember. That. A little bell rings, rings, whatever, something, you know. But every time a bell rings, yeah, a little angel gets ringed, you know. But, um, you know, and people, I've told that before too, people don't become angels. And, you know, in fact, honestly, most angels don't even have wings. Only some angels have wings. Everybody thinks that all these angels have wings. Like the cherubim and seraphim do and stuff. But it doesn't say, like, your angel, regular angels or archangels, that they even have wings, you know? I mean, they, I think they're like us. They have that, like, that's why they look just like a man, you know? They I've look said like that. Soldiers. They look just like a man. They look like soldiers. Like, yeah, I mean, they're, you know, every time you, you see them, they're always... You know, they, they look, you know, they say they're talking about being a man, you know, they, and like I said, that's the real body. That's not, they just made that appearance as a man, you know, and then they lost their wings temporarily or whatever. No, that, that is their real body. But um, let's look up Philippians chapter 3, verse 21. Philippians chapter 3, verse 21. But again, I mean, this is clearly another unscriptural belief. But Philippians chapter 3, verse 21. Who shall change our vile body that may be fashioned like unto his glorious body, according to the working whereby he is able even to subdue all things unto himself. So clearly, read this again. Philippians chapter 3, verse 21. Who shall change our vile body that it may be fashioned like unto his glorious body? So again, we're going to be just like what Jesus looked like. You know, obviously I'm not going to say we're looking like him, but I'm saying we're going to look like him in the sense that Jesus didn't have wings and neither are we. You know, just, you know, we'll have the same type of body like we have now. But according to the working whereby he is able even to do all things unto himself. So, you know, this idea that we're going to go around having wings later on, you know, again, it's just another unscriptural thing. But uh, 
We'll look at one more real quick and then we'll stop for the night. That really would make me feel bad because I kill things with wings. <laughs> <laughs> you pluck them all up. Uh, you wanted people. Last one. Uh, so don't, let's go down. I have wings that you can start swatting. Yeah, there's yeah. wasps in the room. I'm killing That's right, you'll throw a spitball over now. All right, uh, so let's do one more. She, another thing she said was that she was told the exact time of the return of Jesus. And this, again, can be found in her early writings on pages 15, 34, and 285. Now, Scripture says we cannot know. Now, you guys know this, but let's look it up again in case somebody's listening don't know it. Turn to Mark chapter 13, verse 32. You know, and you can find it elsewhere in Matthew and Luke as well, but we're going to look at Mark chapter 13, verse 32. Mark chapter 13, verse 32. But of that day and that hour knoweth no man, no, not the angels which are in heaven, neither the Son, but the Father. So even the angels and stuff don't know. And remember, Jesus himself didn't even know when he was a man down here on earth. But yet she thinks she knows. Again, that's why all these cults all these, always seem to they always seem to know the dates. You know, remember Jehovah's Witnesses have she predicted thinks she's these dates. Than Jesus. Well, yeah, I mean these and exactly, and, and that's why I said Jehovah's Witnesses were the same thing. They had predicted these dates. And, you know, all of them always predicting all these dates that they all seem to, like you said, they all think they're better and higher than Jesus. And um, I'm going to go ahead and read this last one because we've already read this first uh, since it was related to what we started, but. Another thing she said was Jesus did not enter the most holy place in heaven before October 22nd, 1844. And that's again from her early writings, page 42. Now I've already shown you, you know, that whole thing, how Jesus clearly did. But, and she even had the exact date, it's October 22nd, 1844. But, you know, Hebrews, which was written long before 1844, says otherwise. And I already read the first two, so you guys don't really need to turn there. But Hebrews chapter 9, verse 12. Hebrews chapter 9, verse 12. Neither by the blood of goats and calves, but by his own blood he entered him once into the holy place, having obtained eternal redemption for us. So, you know, and, and I told you there, there's many other places there in Hebrews where it, it, it talks about a lot of the same, same type of thing. You know, and I, I gave you that whole, whole, you know, brief spiel there in the beginning and last week and stuff. So, you know, again, I mean, just to, to sit here and say he never entered prior to that, well, then everybody was still in their sins, you know, prior to I mean, you know, again, it's just, their false teachings are just, they're just that, they're false teachings. I mean, they're, they're just not based on any type of, type of scripture or anything else. I mean, you know, then to just come up with this exact date and so forth, you know, I didn't look it up what day of the week it was. I, you know, I guess I should have found out, you know, what day that Jesus went and did all that for us. But anyway, we're going to stop there for the night and uh, we'll continue next week. We'll pick up with uh, part four of it. We'll go over some more of her writings. You know, I want to go over a few more of her, her uh, some of her bizarre writings and stuff. But we'll close with a word of prayer and then we'll be dismissed. Father, we again thank you for this time to just come to you. We just pray for safety as each and every one leaves here tonight. We just pray for a safe return for the midweek service. And we just pray that you be a group during the week. And just all those that need your healing touch. And just uh, continue to be with Omer and different ones. And uh, that end of Ren. And just each of those, Lord, that just need your healing touch. Just, you know who they are, Lord. Just be with everyone in this church. Father, we just ask that you may bless this church, the people in it, that you um, use me just to teach them the things that need to be taught. We just pray again that for any Seventh-day Adventists that might be listening to this, that they might listen to what's being told and look it up for themselves and just find the truth, Lord. Just, just they would pray to you and ask, them, ask you to reveal them the truth. And I know, Lord, that if they do, that you will give them the, show them the truth. And so, Father, we just ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.